Well, hi students, I want to welcome you to this narrated PowerPoint, which is meant to introduce you to the major features of the Book of Acts. I'm going to share my screen now, and you'll be able to both watch and listen to the presentation. Enjoy. A case study that I often refer to shows us the complexity of interpreting the book of Acts for our day. Not only, of course, that we seek to understand historically what's happening in the text, but then we also have the bridge, uh, have to bridge that study uh, to what this book might mean for the church today. For example, the radio speaker on a Sunday morning uh, preaching show was a successful minister in one of the major Protestant denominations. His text was Acts 5. His topic was power. He spoke eloquently of the many ways in which most of us misuse our authority. Parents abuse their children by their negativism. Government leaders show insens insensitivity to the pains of those in need. We destroy by criticism when we should be building up with our praise. As he approached the last part of his radio message, the preacher finally came to his text. In the narrative of Acts, he found a dramatic example of the misuse of power. Ananias and Sapphira, weak Christians who had just given in to their temptations, were in need of reassurance and upbuilding. The Apostle Peter, in an ugly display of arrogance, abused his authority and denounced their conduct with awful threats. Terror consumed each of them in turn, and they died on the spot under Peter's terrible infected. Now, whether or not you agree with that interpretation is not really the point. It's fairly immaterial. The point of this uh, rather aberrant interpretation of what's happening in Acts chapter 5 simply uh, wakes us up to the reality of New Testament narrative. Narratives are not didactic. Narratives require an interpretive process that can lead in many different directions to several different conclusions. And so we should pay special, special, special attention to the context and themes of Acts so that our interpretation for today is biblical and responsible. Let's begin with studying the structure of the book of Acts. Often, meaning is found in the structure of any biblical document, and Acts is no exception to this rule. Number one, it's important to recognize that Acts is not written to encompass all early church history. If you were to ask the average Christian, what is the book of Acts all about? He or she would inevitably say, well, it's a book about early church history, and that's true. That's not incorrect. It would be incorrect to say that Acts is telling the whole story of the first decades of the church. In fact, very intentionally, Luke is not trying to do this. For example, there are many things Luke did not do. He did not give much information about individual apostles. We hear about uh, uh, Peter and Paul the most, some from James, some from Philip at the very beginning, but more than half of the apostles are unnamed in the uh, secondly, Luke was obviously not interested in church organization or polity. He comments on various early Christian communities without giving us a list of shoulds in terms of their organization or their political setup. Also, Luke didn't cover the church's geographical expansion that did not proceed directly west to Rome. Let me show you this on a map. You can see on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen uh, the area of Israel. This snapshot is of Europe and the Mediterranean world, which comprised the Roman Empire at the time. And Acts tells the story of the church's growth straight away from Israel to Rome there in the middle of the screen. Uh, therefore, Acts talks a lot about uh, Turkey, which you can see um, there in the uh, kind of mid-southeast, and also Greece, uh, which is right in the middle of the arrow. We also know that the early Christian movement is spreading in other directions, directions that aren't simply between Israel and Rome. For example, the gospel quickly spreads uh, east into what is now Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Iran, but that's not covered in Acts. We also know that there's a robust Christian presence in a hurry in northern Africa, particularly Alexandria, which became arguably the first major seat of Christian seminaries and Christian learning. But Luke does not cover any of that because that's not his aim to encompass all church history. He just wants to tell you the part of church history that fulfills his goals in the book. Fourth, 
Luke was not interested in standardizing worship practices, but simply relays diversity without comment. For example, in the book of Acts, the gift of tongues accompanies the reception of the Holy Spirit in some cases, but not in every case. There are different prayers. There are different worship approaches in differing Christian communities. For heaven's sakes, in some sermons, such as the sermon to Athens, Paul does not even mention Jesus. So there is a lot of diversity in the messaging and the worship practices of each individual Christian church. Finally, all of this leads us to the simple conclusion. Church history per se was not Luke's reason for writing. He is writing church history, but that's not the point. He's using church history toward a different goal. Next key to the structure of the book of Acts is a simple verse, and, that, and that's Acts 1, verse 8, when Jesus says, You will be my witnesses in Judea, in Jerusalem, and Samaria, in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and even unto the ends of the earth. And in fact, in chapters 1 through 12, we see the first half of that verse fulfilled in the narrative. The gospel spreads in and around Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And then in chapters 13 to 28, the narrative congeals around Paul as Paul spreads the gospel toward Rome. So this is the way that Acts is structured. The book of Luke also had a pronounced geography in its structure. It's often referred to as a travel narrative. Acts works the same way. The gospel starts in Israel and meanders its way westward toward C, Luke portrays the shift in early Christianity from a Jewish to a Gentile movement. This is not simply thematic, it is also structural, and we see that by way of the major mile markers of that shift that are located in the text. In Acts chapter 2, the church begins in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen, a, a Jewish person with a Greek name, uh, is, becomes the first Christian martyr at the hands of of a Jewish community in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 9, we have the conversion of Saul to Paul. In Acts chapter 10, Peter has a vision of Cornelius, a Roman centurion, who becomes a believer and a receptor of the Holy Spirit's work. And then in Acts chapter 15, we find the epicenter of this shift in Acts. The Jerusalem Council, at which Gentiles are officially accepted into the Christian movement, without the necessity of Torah observance. Luke is carefully depicting this shift, using Paul as the hinge, and then showing its official acceptance in the broad church in Acts chapter 15, where it is the pillars of Jerusalem who seem to make the final decision that the Gentiles will not have to become Jews in order to be a part of the people of God, the people of Jesus. Finally, in Acts 28, Paul preaches freely in Rome, uh, fully capping off that shift, even within the very household of Caesar. We go on in the structure of Acts when we look at Paul's three missionary journeys, which depict the evangelization of many of the urban centers of the Roman Empire. If we only had the letters of Paul, it would be difficult to piece these journeys together, although those letters certainly depict a man who is constantly on the move. Acts gives us the structure for understanding Paul and builds specifically the second half of the book, chapters 13 to 28, around specific missionary trips that Paul takes. Here again is the Roman Empire of the day, which were the lands surrounding the Mediterranean Sea. And here's a chart that depicts the, third, the three missionary journeys of Paul, you can see in the purple arrow that the first journey is much more concise than the others as Paul goes around uh, various parts of modern-day Turkey and then back through Cyprus. However, in his second and third journey, he goes quite far all the way to Macedonia, all the way to Greece and back. And in this particular chart, Paul's prison journey is recorded as a fourth journey when Paul is arrested in Jerusalem and taken by prison ship all the way to Rome, which is also narrated in Acts. Typically, the fourth journey is not considered a missionary journey because Paul is not evangelizing urban cities. Paul is a prisoner on that journey. Uh, there is a pattern of Paul's ministry within these missionary journeys, which also provides a key to understanding the structure of Acts. In this pattern, Paul typically shows up in a given urban center, and he first preaches in the synagogue. He has success in the synagogue among Gentile proselytes and God-fearers, 
For example, we mentioned Cornelius, the first Gentile convert. He is a God-fearer. That is, he is connected to the synagogue. He is a worshiper of the God of Israel. However, uh, he is not a full convert. He has not allowed himself to be circumcised and taken the yoke upon Torah, the yoke of Torah upon himself. And instead, he worships God, the God of Israel, as a Gentile. And these are the people who seem in the book of Acts to immediately and naturally respond to Paul's message about Jesus. I see there is Jewish hostility as a result of this success. Paul, in response, withdraws from the synagogue, recognizing the rejection and sometimes even danger there. This leads to further successful ministry among Gentiles as Paul shifts his attention from the Jewish center of that city uh, to, to the Gentiles of the city. And persecution uh, is a result of this shift. And finally, Paul is forced to flee from the city in order to spare his life. Interestingly, we see a nice example of this in Paul's own letters from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And it's always helpful to study what Paul says by his own hand alongside the narrative descriptions of Acts. Let's look at some contextual features of the book of Acts that might help us locate it historically and as a piece of literature. Number one. Acts is written as a sequel to Luke. Now, we do not know whether these books were written at the same time or if time transpired between their writing. I think it makes the most sense to postulate that these books were always written as a single unit and probably circulated as a single unit. Number two, Acts, just like Luke, is addressed to Theophilus, which indicates a Gentile audience. We see in Luke's prologue, Theophilus addressed as O Most Excellent Theophilus, which is also a title used for various Roman magistrates that Paul addresses in the speeches of Acts. He will say, O Most Excellent Festus. So whether or not Theophilus is a, is a, a literary creation or a a specific historical Roman, the trajectory of the book is definitely written toward the Gentile. And number three, the final scene of Acts may indicate a date in the early 60s. This is the traditional view of dating Acts. Uh, this is because Caesar Nero is in power about the time that Paul would have been imprisoned in Rome. And we know that Caesar Nero was the first systemic persecutor of, of Christians, at least locally in Rome. You may have heard uh, the, the old adage, the old fable that Nero played the fiddle while Rome burned. Well, that's probably not true, but we do know that there was a great fire that, that burned up literally more than half of the city under Nero's rule. And he did a politically expedient thing and blamed the Christians on that fire and tortured them in various ways uh, by the thousands, as we can see in this artistic rendering. It may be that Paul was caught up in the neurotic persecution, uh, and that is where the letter from the book of Acts leaves off. However, that view of dating has actually fallen out of favor with, with more recent scholars who would prefer a date in perhaps the 80s or 90s AD. Uh, number four, as we continue speaking about the contextual features of Acts, Acts is distinguished by its historical value and its theological insight. For example, historically, Acts mentions over 30 countries, 50 towns, numerous islands, and nearly 100 people, 60 of whom are unknown elsewhere in the New Testament. Luke shows an impressive grasp of geography, local politics and customs, seafaring, and the general Mediterranean world. And many of those places, specifically the seafaring material uh, that is a part of Paul's prison journey to Rome, the Greek is very, very difficult because we do not have a lot of Greek corollaries to that kind of linguistic world word field in classical literature. Theologically, one-fifth, the full 20% of Acts, is speeches and sermons, giving us insight into the early uh, theological framework of the first Christian. And all this uh, adds up to the fact that Luke and Acts, Luke's pen makes up one-fourth of the entire New Testament. So he's pulling a great load of the New Testament canon that we have. Let's talk about key themes in the book of Acts, themes that are very unique to this document. Well, we would expect, of course, for some of those themes to be shared in Luke's gospel, and indeed they are. Those themes shared with Luke's gospel include the universality and the political innocence of the Christian message. 
political innocence and universality being, of course, the major pitfalls that the early Christians with their message are trying to overcome. Here they are preaching the gospel of Jesus to the same Roman Empire that crucified Jesus. This led to uh, a lot of questions over whether or not Christianity was a politically subversive movement. And in the book of Acts, Luke's Luke wants to uh, present a resounding no to that message. In fact, he wants to say that the Christian message is actually good for the empire. For example, when we look at all of the Roman officials in the Acts, Cornelius, Herod, Sergius Paulus, various city magistrates, Gallio, city clerk, Claudius Lysus, Felix, Festus, Agrippa, Jason, all except Herod, are portrayed as sympathetic characters. And what's interesting, of course, is Herod is the only Roman official who would be partially Jewish, a ruler in Israel. So he is the only one that receives a, a, a negative portrayal by Luke's writing. Instead, the Roman officials are good. Great example is in Acts 17, verses 6 and 7, which says when they did not find them, that is Paul, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. Why would Luke write this into his narrative? Because this is the question that the Roman Empire had about early Christians. Are they not uh, defying Caesar's decrees, and do they not believe in a different king than Caesar. And so we can see in narratives like this, Luke meeting that cultural critique head on. The second theme is the guidance of the Holy Spirit. In the same way that Jesus was the champion and leader of the movement of the gospel of Luke, the Holy Spirit takes over that role in the book of Acts for the first churches. Number three, the kerygma, as scholars have called it, uh, is a key theme in Acts, which scholars have framed as the content of early Christian preaching. Acts is the book where many scholars have gone to understand <coughs> the basic outlines, the basic uh, substances, the, the, the non-negotiables of early Christian preaching. And interestingly, uh, out of the sermons and speeches of Acts, there is a pattern that forms. First, the proclamation of the early Christian kerygma, or in, in Greek, that is preaching or proclamation or announcement. The age of fulfillment has arrived. Acts chapter 2 is a great place to go to see this kerygma played out. Second, Jesus is affirmed by God in Scripture. Third, Jesus is affirmed by the Old Testament. And fourth, repent, believe, and receive, often accompanying water baptism. These are the four segments of the early Christian preaching that we see cycled over and over and over again in the book of Acts. The fourth key theme is the dominant role of the charismatic anointing in Acts. Acts portrays key individuals who are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to preach, to heal, to work miracles. Not all these are apostles, but of course apostles are gifted specifically with this charismatic anointing. The fifth key theme is, of course, God. God is the driver of the narrative in the book of Acts. Six, Jesus remains at the center of the narrative. He does not exit the scene post-ascension, but instead we see Christian communities praying for Jesus, speaking in the name of Jesus, and preaching the message of salvation in Jesus. Seven, mission is a key theme of, of Acts. And this mission seemed to be a distinctly Christian innovation in the early church. Scholars like Martin Goodman have done remarkable work indicating that Christians invented something new when their faith required them to live on mission, to win other people, to expand, and to grow. These impulses were simply not inherent to other faith systems or cult systems of the time. Number eight, the poor and outcasts, who were a major theme and major players in the Gospel of Luke remain important to the book of Acts. Number nine, prayer is a key theme. We see the early church engaging in the patterns, habits, and of corporate and personal prayer throughout the narrative. Number ten, 
the church is clearly seen as the people of God in the book of Acts. The book of Acts doesn't really have a place necessarily for the nation of Israel. Paul covers that in Romans 9 through 11. We, we find that addressed a few times in the New Testament. But Acts is purely centered on the church as the new people of God. And then finally, the role of women is a key theme in Acts, as it was in the book of Luke. We see women in prominent leadership positions within the church. Let's talk about the biblical context of Acts. And when we ask questions of biblical context, we're simply asking, what unique contribution does Acts make to the New Testament canon? To phrase this in another way, if Acts didn't exist in the New Testament canon, what would we lose? Here are some of those unique contributions. Number one, Acts serves as a biblical bridge between the Gospels and the life of the early church. In this sense, Acts plays a specific structural function within the canon itself and the order of the canon. Before we move from the life of Jesus to the letters of the church, we see depicted in the book of Acts the life, the growth, the planting of these early churches themselves. Number two, Acts introduces the major figures of the early church. We would know so little about the 12 disciples, especially Peter, after uh, the life of Jesus. Uh, we would know a lot less about Paul and where he comes from and the fact that he's a Roman citizen and the specifics of his missionary journeys. We would know little about James, who seems to play a major leadership role after Peter in the Jerusalem church. Much information that is nowhere else about these figures is found in the book of Acts. Number three, Acts introduces us in a significant way to the figure of Paul. Acts tees up Paul for the actual letters in the New Testament. Acts shows us that the centrifugal force of the Christian movement's expansion throughout the Roman Empire uh, is because of Paul, his leadership, his passion, and his preaching. Finally, let's look at the church context of the book of Acts. Certainly, we could spend hours talking through this, but what are some of the uh, big highlight unique contribution that the book of Acts has made to the history of the Christian church. Number one, Acts has been a major catalyst in missiological movements, especially among evangelical Christians. Evangelicalism, which includes uh, all kinds of uh, Protestant groups, really is indebted to the book of Acts and its focus on mission. This has been a hallmark of evangelical Christianity for the past century or more. Number two, Acts has influenced church structure. Various Christian denominations and groups have looked to Acts to figure out how we should structure ourselves, who should be in charge, how is authority going to work here. And then number three, the rise of Pentecostalism has had a massive impact in the world. Pentecostal Christianity spans many denominations and takes its origins from a very specific reading of Acts, and especially Acts chapter 2, that expects the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be made manifest in the church and in the world, as we see in the New Testament itself. This began with Azusa Street in 1906, a revival that began, as you can see, in what was essentially a barn in the Los Angeles area. The preacher and leader of Azusa Street is the African-American gentleman on the front row, William Seymour. He was illiterate, and yet he built uh, what became one of the largest churches in America at that time, breaking the color barrier and also breaking the gender barrier, as you can see. Harvey Cox has been teaching at Harvard Divinity School for many decades now, and in his book, Fire from Heaven, The Rise of Pentecostal Spirituality and the Reshaping of Religion in the 21st Century, he overviews how this specific reading of the Book of Acts by early Pentecostals quickly rose to become the fastest growing faith movement the world had ever seen. He says this, what is now called the Pentecostal movement burst forth in 1906 amid unpromising circumstances in a rundown section of Los Angeles. Led by an African-American preacher with no theological education, its first adherents were poor domestic servants, janitors, and day workers, black and white, who had the audacity to claim that a new Pentecost was happening, the new Jerusalem was coming soon, and that they were its designated heralds and grateful first fruit. Finally, as an interpretive exercise, I want to ask a question that is found in a popular book by Gordon Fee and Doug Stewart called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. When it comes to interpreting the material of the book of Acts, a big question is, uh, is this material descriptive or prescriptive? That is, 
Is it prescribing what we should do today? Must I follow suit? Or is it describing the way a diverse set of Christian communities um, worked a long time ago, thus leading to the question, may I follow suit? Here's what Fee and Stewart say. Our assumption shared by many others is this. Unless scripture explicitly tells us we must do something, what is only narrated or described does not function in a normative or obligatory way, unless it can be demonstrated on other grounds that the author intended it to function in this way. This leads to many interpretive decisions that are required by the text of the book of Acts. For example, in Acts 2 and 4, do these passages describe or do they prescribe the Christian view of ownership and giving? Acts 2 and, and 4 are clearly a moment in which the Jerusalem church practiced Christian communism. Did it work then? Is it for us now? Also in Acts 1 and 16, do these passages describe or prescribe the means of determining God's will? In Acts 1, dice are thrown, literally following the Old Testament tradition of the umim and the thumim, in order to determine the will of God. Are they describing what we should do, or are they prescribed? Another example is in Acts 4 and 5, do these passages uh, describe or prescribe the moment when it is appropriate to disobey the government, which the apostles do? And then finally, a nice exercise is to read the five Pentecosts in Acts. By Pentecost, we, we mean moments when Luke says that believers were filled with the Holy Spirit. So do these passages describe or do they prescribe the accompaniment of the gift of tongues with the reception of the Spirit? My encouragement to you is to take this structural data, this contextual data, and apply it to your reading of the book of Acts so that you might interpret it for your context and our contemporary setting today.